performance analysis. Um, he's just going to kind of go and take us through a couple of things um, uh, that is, has kind of helped him throughout his career, um, uh, especially more notably with Wales uh, and with Paphos, um, and kind of just going to show us how Instat has, uh, has helped him along the way. So I'll pass off to Charlie and um, he's going to explain a bit more. So welcome, Charlie. Thanks, Jonathan. I'll just, uh, I'll just share my screen now. So Perfect, perfect. Okay, yeah, so yeah, once again, thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, obviously, this is uh, interesting times right now, uh, not just for football, for everyone. For sure, for sure. So stay safe at home. Um, and today, we're going to sort of go through um, how we did something in, sort of in partnership with Instat, um, and I was actually at the FAW last year, um, in terms of collecting our own data, but also using some Instat data um, to formulate basically a, a study um, of the 2019 Women's World Cup. Um, and basically within that uh, project, there's, there's lots of different reasons why, why uh, national government bodies need to sort of do these types of projects to stay in line with the benchmarking of other national teams uh, within the game. Um, and also it provides us with different other reasons as well uh, for doing the project. Um, so really we're just sort of going to go through certain things. So I want to kind of explain why we did it first. So we did it as an FAW and FAW Trust project. So, uh, Within that uh, department, there's, there's actually five performance analysts there at the moment. Um, and within that, we've actually got student placements. So we utilize the student placements uh, for numerous reasons. Where it's one of them is to um, help us with the national team uh, camps, tournaments, uh, games, um, everything within that. And also within that, they actually undertake a, a good uh, load of work for us in terms of coding games, um, help us produce statistical reports and, and things for our national teams. Um, and they're, they're a big uh, part of our workforce under Esther Wills at the FW Trust, yeah. uh, which, help, which helps along the way. Um, and the main, the main thing really from the women's point of view in the women's national team is to try and benchmark performance uh, from the Women's World Cup 2019 qualifying, because we just missed out. So um, unfortunately, we missed out on the last game to uh, losing to England. Um, if we'd have won that game, we'd have gone on to qualify for the tournament. Um, and obviously it wasn't just to be, but we came such a long way over that period of time um, with how the girls played and obviously under Jane Ludlow. Um, and we, we're trying to obviously then now progress for what, when I was there up to year 2021 um, and see how, you know, how we could try and prepare for that. Because one of the teams within this tournament was actually Norway. So actually it provided us a good idea to say, okay, what are these teams doing uh, that are qualifying that we're not doing? Um, and you know how, how can we link our data yeah. that into that, um, yeah. and then obviously as well, it's, it's an informative presentation idea. So the FAW run uh, performance analysis conferences. I know Instat sponsored that this year. Um, it's something that's really good um, for people interested in the field and coaches alike to attend. Um, so the FAW sort of asked me to sort of you know look at that today. It's a great thing to attend. You know we did it in partnership with Instat this year. Hope to do it again in the future. Um, so that'd be yeah. good. Um, yeah, very beneficial for sure, and uh, yeah, just a highlight on that. Um, yeah. You know, partnerships like this, you know, help help kind of spread the brand and um, and, and spread you know the, the kind of the good stuff that we do and, and help develop you know teams such as such as the Welsh Welsh national team. Hundred percent, and we've had a lot of success off it as well. Um, obviously, our women's teams are nearly close again, doing really well in the year twenty twenty one. The men's have obviously qualified for year twenty twenty, um, and. The youth age groups on both sides are qualifying for the elite rounds, which is fantastic to see. And since we've gone to that partnership, it's, it's worked really, really well. Yeah. Uh, so really as well, we're going to sort of go over sort of the full circle of um, analysis as well with using data, using video and linking the two together, which is a key thing in the role. So because the main thing for us is to try and make informed decisions uh, or give coaches uh, information to make informed decisions, um, you know, uh, the needs all the right information they can get to help them make these decisions as well. So, you know, it needs to be relevant to the context we're working in as well. So ideally this study that we did uh, together within that was geared towards how we wanted to develop as a national team when I was at Wales. Perfect. So, you know, as I said, at the time, uh, it's got a lot of better since then, obviously with yourselves and other data companies uh, within that. And obviously the technical report has, has shown that there's been an advancement in this, but there's not a massive amount uh, of data in the female game out there. So there wasn't a lot for me at the time when I was in this role to go to Jane and say, you know, these are the trends. So we had to do it ourselves, which is a really, really big thing. 
Um, yep. And it's a time consuming thing as well. Uh, even people in club environments will know to try and keep on top of the trends yourself is, is very hard. Um, and likewise on the men's side as well. So I would, it'd, be hard, it'd be difficult to say if we were in the right position to do it um, back in 2015, because I wasn't there at the time. Um, but the men's have done it for the last three major tournaments. And I think even, I wouldn't say it was a major contributor to the factor, but I think it would definitely help coaches make these decisions um, the year of 2016 campaign that Wales had on the men's side. And obviously, in Russia 2018 was a benchmark project to uh, qualify for year 2020. Um, and likewise, you know, now with the females, we want to try and, the female game, trying to introduce more data, do really well from that and use it in our tactical preparation for year 2021 when I was at the FAW. Um, and these were sort of the six areas uh, that we looked at and it was the main focus for us, so how teams attack the final third. So I was, I've got a really big thing of looking how teams attack the final third, because I think if you break it down within that, you can pick out some really good trends on how teams are successful, not only in the standard that you're playing at, but in different leagues. Um, there's a big difference between the top and bottom of the divisions as well, in terms of how, not just the number, but how they do it as well. Um, in goals, obviously, it's, it's kind of a bit self expansion but how they were scored and the type of build-up that led to those goals, we sort of looked at that. Um, we also did a goalkeeper analysis, um, so how keepers distributed the ball. Um, so the types of distribution, where they're distributed, um, and also we looked at how they dealt with high balls coming to the box from crosses, so where they affected within the penalty box. Um, possession is quite a fairly self-explanatory one, but we looked at that. Uh, across the teams. And then we also want to look at how teams counterattack, so transitions, um, and how they did on set plays as well. So different things within yeah. that. And, and I'm guessing, like you said, this, for instance, is, is something you would be able to first-hand get information from Instat to kind of get this information, get this data, um, you know. So, I mean, it's, it's, we also be married the two. I think this was primarily our data collection, and then we, we sort of cross-referenced it with other data sources like Instat. So, for example, obviously within your data reports, you've got final third attacks. It was quite an easy thing to compare. It's mm -hmm. a good thing, like a validity perspective as well. So, as I said before, we had a team of eight or nine students from universities in Wales that helped us with this project, and we had a checking process within it. And also, we when we did, when we sort of sift through the data ourselves, we we checked for any sort of missing areas or anything like that, and then we sort of went back into the games and corrected it. And then we did a final check of marrying it up against other data yeah. sources reporting on it. So like, for example, in Snap. Um, yeah, so it helps fine tune almost that. Yeah, yeah. Fine you know, what you're giving then is, is valid work. You know, yeah. it's random stabs in the dark. Um, so that's good. Um, so these are the main six areas we looked at. So they were quite relevant to us at the time. And I thought it would be something that would influence our environment. We're not wasting our time in, in other areas. Okay. The, main, the main one we'll probably look at first is the final third. So, um, like I said, it's how teams attack the final third, the number of times they do it, um, and we sort of do a cross-reference cross analysis of all the teams yep. uh, that mm -hmm. uh, it will cut. So, just to explain this graph, we basically um, looked at their conversion rate. So, the team's conversion rate is going to the left-hand side. So, the higher you are with that graph, the better conversion rate you had of your final third chances. At the bottom end, you've got the, the, the amount and average per game uh, these teams were having. So the main four teams I'm going to focus on in this presentation are the Korea Republic, not South Korea, also known as um, Japan, uh, the USA and Italy. OK, so um, Italy, as you can see, they've got a low number of final thirds, but they've got a high conversion rate. So that's something that's really interesting to look at. Um, Korea and Japan have both got quite high numbers uh, of final thirds, but a low conversion rate. Uh, and they also obviously, if you see the results, they failed probably from, in terms of their targets at this tournament um, in 2019. And then also the USA obviously went on to win the tournament. They've got high of everything. So we sort of yeah. want to link this data collection and what we sort of looked at with both sides and uh, try to basically put it in towards uh, the video yeah and, and and how do you how does it kind of go about that like how do you go and, and improve Wales by looking at this graph here like you know what did you implement to kind of to, to help them improve and did it improve 
uh, over time, well, so in terms of obviously the effect from this study, I, it's hard to tell in terms of this because I've, I've left since then, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Nice to see this campaign through. But um, the, in prior, uh, I can give you a good example of this. So I, we, we introduced this final third data collection really early on yeah. as a, something that's kind of transitioned. I took it from uh, Ryan Meads, who's an experienced analyst uh, at Leeds United uh, when I was there at the time. And this is something I thought was really interesting. I took it mm -hmm. square with me and adapted it to sort of the, the environments that I was working in. Um, and I want basically then to try and help understand where Wales was at as a national team and see where we could go uh, in that qualifying campaign. So for example, when in that qualifying campaign, we, we know we played uh, majority of the game uh, within our defensive shape and tried to counter-attack. But what we needed to do was obviously try and improve the number of final third attacks. Okay. So we were quite low on scoring uh, final third attacks. So we were averaging within our group stage games. I think it was it was definitely below twenty final third uh, per game. But whereas teams that we knew that were qualifying uh, the top end of the group were having thirty plus per game uh, on average. So we knew we had to achieve at least to get above the twenty mark. And so over that twelve month period post qualifying campaign and preparing for the new qualifiers, we I was benchmarking that data uh, and we, we actually managed to improve over time. And that obviously comes with then, obviously the manager, Jane, and the coaches within that saying, okay, how do we go about, how do we go about increasing the number, um, but also trying to um, keep our defensive structure in place? Because we had a great, we had, in terms of our defensive record in that campaign, we were fantastic. I think we kept six clean sheets or seven clean sheets within that campaign. Um, so yeah, it's just how we, how we improved that side of things. Um, and and we did do that, and we, like I said, we we, we st now I know the girls are now constantly hitting between twenty five and thirty five per game, so they're hitting above oh, that. Wow. So we know in terms of what Jane's done and Lauren and John have done to adjust that, they've you know it, it's worked. Um, so the first team I was going to look at really is the career, career Republic. So these are an interesting one for me because they they actually finished. Uh, sorry, they're ranking going into this tournament. I think they're within the top 15. So in terms of expectation level, they're expected to get out of the group. Um, and they didn't. Um, so sort of the reasons why myself and uh, Zarek decided the FAW Trust wanted to try and look at this was seeing why they didn't get out of the group. And as I said before, referencing that graph, they've got a high number of final thirds, but a low conversion rate. So the videos really within this sort of show why that, why that took place. Um, so the main thing really, the first in this first clip, um, there's no real threat to the back line. So you see here, they've got it out wide. Now we're in the final third. No one's actually threatening the back line um, in the key area of the pitch. So you see again, there's no, there's nobody within the danger zone. Um, now she could play on the overlap and get into a dangerous area. She decides to hold on, take a few more touches, and then now it slows down. No way behind the ball, and they claim. Okay. Okay. Um, and also another one for Korea within this was actually the build-up plays really, really slow. So for example, this clip, the, the two nil down, 10 minutes to go. Um, and I think they had to draw or win this to stay within a shout of the, the group stage. Um, and this just shows, for example, the two slow. So good pass through. And here really, she, she could bounce inside. And now they've got a 4v4 against the, the Korean backline. So against the Nigerian backline, wing is running in behind. She decides to hold on, take a few touches, slows the play down. And when this pass comes back now, Nigeria have actually got eight defenders behind the ball. So this just shows an example of why Korea's conversion rate was so low. So they're in the final third, converted. And again, it rolls on. We get into a good area, but again, it breaks down. Japan were another team we looked at as well. So um, they, I think they got to semi-finals of the previous tournament. Um, they've done really well. High expectations coming to this. They, they got through the group stage, uh, but got knocked out in the round, the, 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 the second round of that. Um, again, high number of final thirds with a low conversion rate. But there, the reason why they had a low, low conversion rate was probably different to Korea. So I think, as we'll go through the video in a second, they, I think they were a little bit more unlucky in terms of the finishes that they did, and also, um, also the, obviously the fact that 
as well. They just didn't convert chances. They had some really good chances. They didn't convert, and that's obviously let them down. Um, so Japan likes to play like a 4-4-2. So they played a 4-4-2 with the wide midfielders inside. Um, so you can see here the right midfielders rolled inside. And they created an overload in the midfield area. So it allows them to play centrally. Left, left midfielder rolls inside. So it's a good build of play. Keep the ball moving fast. They're obviously good technical players as well, the Japanese. So now they're in the final third. Good movement again. And then they've got the overlap. And then they miss a, a, probably a chance they should score. So it just shows an example of that. So it's a really good build of play to get into the final third. But once they got there, uh, missing key chances on goal. Um, likewise, this is in the knockout game. So obviously one 0 down against Holland. You see that wide midfielder rolled inside the top of your screen. Break a line. It's a good little double movement from the striker to take the defender away. And then you'll see this 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 uh, other, the number ten peel off the back shoulder. Little touch around the corner. And here's the post. There was a chance there that you could have converted. Um, and then even though we're saying, okay, we were a little bit unlucky, we could have finished chance as well, but the way they set up as well with the 4-4-2 structure um, mm -hmm. let them down against some key opposition. So they could have, if they'd have beaten Argentina, um, which is this game here, um, they they uh, you know they would have they probably would have got a better draw in the knockout round. Um, but they, they came and stuck against Argentina. So Argentina banked up in a back five, really low defence, um, and, and Japan struggled to break them down. This is a good example of this. So obviously Argentina defending their own half, very making it very difficult for them to play. This is their left midfielder, who's rolled all the way inside now. So she's come all the way in centrally. They've got no one out wide as left midfield position now. So this is the left back on the ball. There are the two strikers highlighted. There's nobody in that space. It's a good space to exploit. So now this strike has come all the way across. And now it's just a, it's a pass down the line into not very little space at all to work in. And obviously it goes out for a goal kick. So it just shows different examples within that, um, how that works. Nice. Um, in terms of, that's, then, that's more of the two teams we looked at in terms of unsuccessful uh, traits. Um, then we're going to move on to sort of more a team that had a little bit more success, but they had a low number uh, of final third attacks, Italy. So they were averaging, I think, in the teens uh, per game, um, but they had one of the highest success uh, conversions. Um, we had prior knowledge to Italy, so we played. We actually played Italy as part of the preparation um, for the uh, for the World Cup. Um, so we got we had managed to have a good look at them. So they're quite an interesting one for us to watch in the tournament. Um, and we knew that they've got fast attacking players, um, which is a key strength of theirs, especially their wide players. Um, and they've got strikers as well that are, are good finishers. Um, so the main the main thing with Italy, as soon as they win the ball back, forward runners are key. So forward runners, as soon as Italy won the ball, you see they're the two two players making forward runs in behind. There's an interesting fact about Italy as well. They actually had the most, I think they had the most VAR goals taken off in the tournament <laughs> because they're, they're constantly threatening the back line with these forward runs. Obviously, the introduction of VAR. So this one, this one I'm just showing you was ruled out. This one was ruled. Oh, yeah. That's so unlucky. Um, so, you know, it's just, it shows that they're, but they're, constant, they're a constant threat, um, which is uh, something I liked about them. Um, difference to between them and, um, like for example, the career example I showed you, they've got a lot of depth and width in their build up as well. So you see now you, both fullbacks are uh, the top of the bottom and the top of your screen. Um, yeah. So when you've got more depth and width, you can you've got a lot more room to play on the field, um, and it opens up spaces and you can play on more limited touches and exploit space, which they've done. So as soon as they're breaking the high press from Brazil. You've got the forward runners again threatening the back line. So there's four people joining the attack. Um, and as when they get into that final third, you see the one at the bottom of the screen, they've got numbers in and around the box to cause problems for the defend for the opposition defense. Again, just referring to that career example I showed you, there's nobody threatening. Yeah. And when and when you take these styles in, into consideration, is it something you kind of 
do you look and aim to play a certain way that a team does, i.e. USA, or, or obviously that's not possible with the players maybe that you have? Do you kind of look to switch it up, you know, yeah. per, per game? Or Examples, I think, um, with Wales, I think we, we, found, we found a successful way of playing. Um, it was manufactured by, uh, obviously, by the manager and the coaching staff, and, and the, the players executed execute some plans to great effect, within, especially within the qualifying campaign. Um, and as you try to evolve as a national team, uh, you want to try and implement some of these things that teams are qualifying for tournaments. Like you want to develop that because there's no doubt in their club environments they're playing with these types of players. Um, but sometimes when you, they've got to try and do what they need to do to succeed. Um, yep. um, whereas at Parfos, for example, obviously Parf, Cameron's, uh, Cameron's obviously way of playing is, is uh, a bit different. Um, He's got a philosophy that he's obviously moulded over a period of time. Um, and players that he's worked with, like Dan James, there's obviously Man United now, he's worked with them, he's at Swansea in the 23s. Um, and he's got particular player profiles that he wants to do. So he's got more of a luxury in a club environment where you can sort of pick upon players to suit your style of play. Yeah. Whereas on the national side, you've got, you know, you, you've got, you, you can't transfer everybody in. You've got to people yeah. who represent that nationality. But in terms of... Um, in terms of the national side, I think that we found a, a way that suited us uh, at the time. Um, but obviously, you want to try and evolve that. So mm -hmm. it's, key for, it's key for these kinds of projects, like you say, to try and, okay, what can we do to reach this level? Um, yeah. Do we have to come in the same way or can we, do we have to bring in stuff that these, these teams do? Nice, nice. Um, and this one, again, just sort of just references Italy's shape. So they dropped up a little, obviously a little bit here. The four four two shape. Um, it transitions to a four two four. And it's, it's interesting. As soon as they win the ball, they've, they've instantly got forward passing options. So you've got, or instantly straight in front of you there, you've got you've got numbers to go. Um, and it ultimately ends up with um, an overloaded numbers on on your back line, which is which is really difficult to deal with if you're a defender. So you see they've got four versus four on the back line. You've got a full back that's joining. It's difficult to deal with. And when you've got an unorganized shape, uh, the players have exploited that, 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 that run there. So it's a great pass through, to be fair. Um, but it just shows that the difference between what Italy uh, were trying to do as compared to the last team to show in terms of those forward runs um, a little bit more width and a bit more depth and mm -hmm. maybe a little bit more daring as well it's probably easy to say because I think the career in Japan builds up were a little bit more patient and it showed that they might possession stats that were collected as well uh, Italy didn't have a lot of possession whereas Japan and Korea had, did, averaged over 50 plus percent possession in the games yeah um, and then the last one within that was obviously USA so obviously they won the tournament um, it easy to say okay well they've got the best players, but it actually it boils down to a little bit more within that as well. It's how they utilise these players. Um, the main thing with them, they 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 were obviously quite expansive, um, but they, they they've always got somebody threatening, as I say before. But they play with a lot of width, players on different lines. So you see there, they threatening the back line. They've got width on both sides of the pitch, a good little balance to them as well. So you see there, good movement to threaten again, but then you've automatically got those numbers in there on the box. To cause a problem. And it's not just against the weaker nations as well, whether they're that expansive. Obviously, England did well in this tournament, but they they, they set up this 2 3 5 shape. As you can see there, you've got three down the centre in between those defenders, and you've got two outside as well on both sides. And you've got that forward run threatening back lining behind from the goal there as well. So there's obviously some trends there, obviously these people attacking the box, it's playing with a little bit of width, but also having forward runners as well. And it's not me saying within this, this is the way to play, it's just sort of this is what kind of materialised and these were trends of the teams that did well in attacking the final third. Because I think, I think I'm sure one, one question I've had in the past is, oh, well, you know, what are you against the, like a possession style? It's not, it's not that. At all for me, I think it's it's just how what they did when they gained the final fix. I think I quite like the the Japan way. Uh, yeah. you know, good technical players in and around that area, but it's just it's how how you achieve 
the call at the end. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's interesting. Uh, and then <clears throat> the last one's finished on USA as well. So something from a bit deeper. Obviously, I've shown where they've been really expansive in that control build-up, but this is where they've come from deep ones. Threaten the back line, difficult to deal with. There's a goal there as well. So the key goal in the tournament where they've shown those trends. Um, so yeah, just to sum up, so just obviously Korea, Japan, um, a lot of final thirds, but not very clinical. Um, Korea being a little bit more slow, um, didn't really threaten the back line. Japan did a bit more of that, but they weren't clinical. Um, Italy were clinical um, and had impotence on a lot of forward runners in numbers in the box. And whereas USA kind of combined those together, obviously forward runs, maintaining width uh, and numbers in the box as well. Yeah. No, no, I think, I think you know, with, with this kind of research, again, like you said, it, it's always going to kind of whittle down to the, the access of, you know, the level of play you have the access to, sorry. So, um, you know, and then kind of building around that, like you said, it, it's going to be great to play like that passing style, that tick attacker, Barcelona, if you will, and or the USA here in this case. But but again, you know, again, it's trying to find that middle ground of where dealing with what you've got uh, and then being as effective as possible. So again, you know, it's obviously a results driven game. Um, and, you know, and, that, and that's, you know, that's what, that's what's, you know, going to help you get, get better positions, better placements for the team and, and progress forwards. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And then the next sort of one we we're going to talk about was that place. So, um, obviously a key component of the game. Sometimes people tend to forget about these things and actually how important they are. Um, and it showed within the data we both collected, it was, it was a third of all goals, or just over a third of the tournament were set plays. Wow. Seems to be an increasing trend, especially at the tournaments now is a third, uh, a third of all goals um, being scored from set plays. I think it was the same at the last men's tournament as well. Um, and within that, we sort of looked at when we looked at the set plays, we want to try and look at how teams were marking as well. So we sort of did a breakdown um, within the whole tournament. So the red being man marking, green being a mix setup. So some zonal players with some man markers, and then just over a quarter of the teams were opting for a zonal style uh, play. Um, then versus we looked at the one we want to look at was France because. It was interesting. The first game France played. After the first game France played, there was, um, there was a massive press hysteria from this about France being a big threat from set play. So that gave us an, an straight away from the right. Let's have a look at France. Um, so when teams were not playing France, so those teams that actually played France weren't playing France. That's where their marking styles. And then once they played, we were playing against France. This was the difference. So a lot of teams were opting more for the mix setup. So there was a reduction in zone, fully zonal. Um, and we're just sort of going to break down that as well within that so obviously it's France we're going to talk about um, and they had sort of they had a bit of key players so there's Henri you'll see at the bottom of the screen and then two main attackers of the ball within their Mbok number 19 and Renard as well um, who's going to attack down the middle um, in this first game against Korea um, it was a bit of a non-contest Korea didn't really contest with France from, from set plays, it was a common trend. Um, see, easy ball in, not tight enough, good, good header as well. Um, and then throughout this game as well, it wasn't just a one-off, you know, um, within this, the France were a constant threat. So it gave us something to look at. Again, no, no real pressure on the, the attacker, another goal. Um, again, we're constantly creating chances from it as well. So they've gone short this time. Haven't dealt with the issue. Left a player on mark and another goal. So it just shows that we were a threat. Um, so obviously this, when you're at a tournament as well, this will raise alarm bells as well as so you think, okay, they've just, they've had the wrong rule after the VAR, but they've, they've just scored. They've put the ball in there three times from a set play. So you, you think instantly this has got something we've got to deal with. So what teams would do, they would sort of put different rules in place uh, within their set plays to try and deal with that. Um, so we're just sort of going to look at like how different teams try to counteract the threats that France had. Um, yeah. Interest for us. So the first team to play it after that was Norway. Um, Norway actually opted for a mixed uh, setup, so they had that short option you saw in the last video. They tried to deal with that, and then they've also tried to deal with 
the runners within uh, the penalty area. So the five-man mark is trying to block. And then they've also got free zonal players within that central area um, dealing with the ball into that dangerous zone, trying to attack that. So you see there, they've come out quickly to attack the ball uh, and deal with the danger. Um, then you've got, when they went, then they went on to play Nigeria, and Nigeria actually opted for a totally different uh, setup altogether. You see that's the danger area where France were going to attack. They've packed that with zonal players. Um, and they've put one poor, one poor player on Renard, who's one of the danger threats from there. So the, the, the positives of doing this is saying, okay, same to France, you're not going to go into this area. So it forced France to deliver outside that target zone. And then another benefit of that was from set play, from the second phase, um, they've got bodies rushing out towards the ball. So it makes it very difficult to get a shot on goal um, to just try and shoot through these bodies. So that was another, that was another benefit. And then finally, when it all sort of came down for France, um, it was in the last game uh, against... <clears throat> Game they played against the USA, so obviously they got knocked out of them. So this is where we've been drawing some of the insight data now to sort of disprove what we're going on going on about here. Um, so this was actually France uh, within that tournament. So you see a lot of in swinging corners into the six yard area, and then not very many um, outside of that area. Okay, so yeah. that was then prior to playing the US. This 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 graphic now is then versus the USA. So you see now they've been forced to actually deliver outside of that target area. Yeah. Uh, and the two they actually tried to put in those area in that area that was unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. So that again raised something to us. Okay, what did USA do? Um, so we could delve into the data we collected. We've used the Instat data there to to cross reference, prove a point. Um, so then now we can go into the video to find out why. Uh, what they decided to do is. I would verge on a, a mix set up with this one. Um, so they've, they've put somebody out to deal with a shot. Also, this player is interesting because she she actually, because it's a left footed in swing delivery, she's actually forcing her to not deliver down this line here. So she now has to deliver towards the penalty, the penalty spot. Um, you've got a line of four or five zonal players within that six yard box. Um, and then you've got three other players there, or four other players within the penalty area dealing with the players in the round that. And what they're going to try and do is try and block um, those players. So you see those five there. Their only role was to attack the ball, no matter what. And then the others were to block the key runners. So you see the rush out, deal with the ball. So it's forced it to know that as soon as they deliver into that area, USA can get straight out and attack the ball. Um, and the benefit of doing that as well uh, not just obviously I've, said, I've spoken about but it's changing the line of the delivery that USA need to do uh, it's also actually showing that it gives you an advantage on the second phase because actually when you've when the zonal players are charged out you've left players in there that are offside so if it's the ball's put back in for the second phase they're going to be offside which is just shown in this clip here okay and again that's, yeah. you know, which is why if, if, that's had to, if that wasn't offside they would especially with the instat system on set pieces, which I'm, I'm sure we'll take a look at a little bit later uh, as, as well. Again, you know, helps helps really set up for this. And again, I think, again, that's really important when I speak with many, many clubs um, it is, is again, how, how they utilise that, how you can look at certain systems, you know, where people are, how many people are in the box. It, again, it gets really specific. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, what, what's, how, how do you kind of like to set up for it? Is again, is it individual again, or, or do you have a preferred system that you kind of like to implement as well? I think we've well. It, I mm -hmm. have experience with with uh, both teams. Um, mm -hmm. With Wales, you're trying to keep a, a consistent. Well, I think we're both you're trying to keep a consistent structure um, because it's familiarity for the players. Number one, and also you can repeat it and get better at it um, when you're coaching as well. If there's any little flaws within that, um, then obviously that's where you, can, you use your coaching time and analysis time to, to sort of deal with that. Um, and also comes in then with the opposition analysis, which we can we can talk about when we go into the instat system. Yeah, uh, sure. if I was looking at that graphic that I just showed you. I would know, and Jane would know, or Cameron would know. Um, okay, they're going to try and deliver into this area. Yeah. Um, whether you make an adjustment to your setup or you just make you just give players clear roles within that uh, is obviously their decision. Yeah. And but 
as I spoke about at the start, it's an informed decision. Yeah, yeah. And so it's good. It's good to have that that way. So I mean, I think with us, uh, especially now Pathos, I think in terms of you've got a set plays, you've got to try and find a, a, a solution from an attacking point of view. So if you're defending, if teams set up a certain way, you've got to try and find a solution to break uh, that opposition structure. And likewise with with uh, the defensive side, you've got to try and something where you've got to try and cover all bases. And that's what the US have done really well there. They've covered yeah. all bases really well. Um, with all the threats that, that France could possibly pose from, from corners. And it's, they didn't actually score from another corner and told them that three again. So even though it might weaken my argument a bit, but it shows that people took notice of the, the, the clear threat from game one. Uh, and you spoke about going into the tournament. Um, so it was, yeah, it was clear to see. Um, so yeah, it's just obviously France have got those key, those three key players uh, attacking in and around the penalty area, um, and then the different methods as well. Then that teams have used to try and combat um, with relatively good success, uh, good success, and especially in the last game for the US. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that's pretty much on that one, um, and then. The last one we're going to sort of speak about, um, which I guess is kind of good in a way, it's kind of fresh news uh, back in the UK. Um, we're going to do like a team case study, um, which is what we did. Um, we used, again, the Instat data, and we also used our own data to, again, to cross-reference a team that done well in the tournament. And we want to try and do the whole analysis process together of taking data, looking at the video, and also looking at the task of problems within it and then seeing how you can overcome it as, you, as, a, as, a, as a coaching team's analysis and then how, how do you go against the potential problems that teams may get again, uh, try and put in. Um, so we're going to look at England's right hand side. So obviously Phil Neville's uh, announced his leaving um, as England manager soon. So it's interesting to see their success within the tournament. Um, also we played them in our qualifying campaign. Um, so we're well aware of the, the threat their right hand side posed. Um, and we want to sort of decipher the success it had at the Women's World Cup, but also what teams did to try and try and combat that. Um, so just using um, we this is a graph that uh, we've put together uh, but we've used uh, data from both uh, Instat and ourselves in terms of the amount of times the England goalkeepers distributed. So you see there Per game, this is per game. Um, on average, the distributes a lot across the back and then quite strongly down the right hand side. So it kind of shows that they're probably going to try and build it from the back and then go out the right hand side uh, as a as a as a possible argument. Um, and then to back that even further, the final third attacks uh, that we've that we've got there um, that we cross reference again, um, it shows it's heavily strong down the right hand side. So it's a common thing. So just again, as I say, it shows, okay, let's look at the video, uh, reasons why they're strong down the right hand side. Mm -hmm. um, so the main thing they tried to do is England within the 4 3, 3 set up, they created a wide diamond. So we've got Steph Houghton, Lucy Bronze, Jill Scott, and Nikita Paris. Um, obviously the, the, the players did rotate throughout the tournament. That was the main, the main four. Um, you see there, it's passed into the centre half. She's got options to go inside and outside there. So that's the, one of the, the good things about the wide diamond. Um, cool. And how um, <clears throat> takes the inside option, passes in great back to Lucy Bronze there. But again, you see there, there's the diamond again, so it's created an overload on the right hand side, 4B3. And then as soon as Lucy can pop this pass through there into the key parish, it sets back. So the use of the whole diamond there, and then they're in behind. The quality is not, not great on the, on the last ball. Um, likewise, a bit higher up the pitch, uh, send it back on the ball again. She slides that pass there into the right back. You see the diamond there again working. We've got four players around three. And then what that top of the diamond Paris has done is dragged that full back out. But the, the key one to look at here is actually the position of Ellen White, the striker. So she's actually operating in between the two centre halves. So she's occupying them, and that means that centre half on the left hand side cannot get out to support the full back. So that's where the diamond's got some success there. So it just shows the strength down. Um, 
And then what we want to look at then, okay, so how do teams try and deal with it? Because obviously it's a common thing that um, teams would have seen this prior to England arriving at the World Cup and also during the World Cup. Uh, how do teams try and combat that? Um, obviously using what would be in my case would do is use data and use the coaching staff uh, achieve achieve the result. So Japan decided to high press them. Obviously we spoke about them earlier, about the four four two um, to combat the white diamond. They wanted to try and do it with a nine and ten press. So ball side centre forward trying to press and force wide to keep the player on that side, and then the other striker would drop in uh, on the other midfielder so they couldn't get out the other way, and then. One of the centre midfielders' jobs was to mark the near side centre midfielder as tight as possible. And then there's a key role for that wide player to have, blocking the line of pass into the right winger, to the top of the diamond. And then also, if that pass is played into Lucy Bronze, it's an aggressive press and it stops them getting out of that side. So the only options for Steph out in there is to really go long or go back to the keeper and go back the other way and Japan can regain shape. If she goes long here, it's a 50-50 and Japan win there, and then they can play. Um, and then what England actually did to do that, so this is all the events, so what England had to do then is trying to find a solve, uh, to solve the problem. And they did that with the position of the deep line midfielder. So what she's done there, she just see her there, just move off the back of uh, the number one, the number 20 for Japan there, or one of the strikers. So she started a little bit closer uh, to that player, and then she just drifted off the back shoulder there. And that is a big distance for that, of a striker to, to follow. And then she's also seen that you can see her hand pointing there. Um, and she doesn't know whether to go and do one job or come and do the new job that she's been tasked with. So that's caused a problem there. And then they get out and play through. And then obviously strong down the right hand side with Lucy Bronze. And then they've got runners going forward. And again, another chance. Um, and then USA tried a different way. So obviously USA knocked England out of the tournament and they, they frustrated England uh, by trying to compact uh, England's right hand side. So it's interesting, we, thought, we found it quite funny that USA would try and force the play to England's strongest side. Um, but they actually decided to try and, you know, to try and keep it compact that way and try and limit the options uh, England had to play. So you see there, there's a diamond. Um, but then they've got USA got bodies in and around those England players there. So very, very hard to play into that area there. So um, Houghton's got a decision here. Does she go on the other side or should she just go into that area there and try and force one of those options? Um, then the position of this player is key for US in this, in this structure um, to try and force it that way. So the position is good because she's stopping a direct switch to the left back. And then also, if, if it's played into that other centre half, who's Millie Bright, it's forced back this way, uh, back in towards the traffic. So it's played in there, and she does the job by forcing it back this way. So then, as soon as Houghton gets it back, she has to play forward. Again, bodies in the round, decent distances between the players. Very, very hard to play through that or play around it. So yeah, it was interesting how USA trying to do that. As soon as they played that area, very aggressive, stop them playing through. So then what England needs to do then is obviously try and find a solve to that. And the solve we saw within this game was that England might to use to try and flatten this player. So use this player to build it with like a sort of a three, three and a half, four. Um, so using a back three with the left back and the two centre halves to build up. But in this clip, you see her go higher now. So now she's forcing it higher. It's actually forced the US to change from a front three. Now it's a flat five um, in midfield. So now that space is a little bit different to you. So now what England have got in their build-up area is actually a 3v1 around the USA centre four. So then what now they can do, England is to try and use the far side space by moving that right winger inside and then it would allow the right back uh, bronze in this case to exploit that space there so it didn't get out down their most dangerous side so playing to midfield or you can play direct from the center half if that space is exploited you know correctly so in this case you see it go in she's gonna look for it it's not on right now 
And then as soon as that midfielder runs inside, you just see it off the screen there, and then she's out the other side, and England are going forward again down the right-hand side. And then in the final third, big chance, and unfortunately she slips there as well. Um, and that's it really from, a, from an England's perspective. Uh, so obviously the key thing we found, obviously heavy down the right side for using the, uh, the data. Um, and then linking that to the video, we found we're trying to create a white diamond. Um, and the solves was to try and press high with a nine and 10 in Japan's case. And then USA would try to keep it down one side and keep, try and keep it compact. Yeah, no, 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 I agree. And, um, you know, I think, you know, it highlights that importance again, you know, when you're on the system itself and you can kind of clearly see what, where and what direction teams are attacking in. Um, so again, obviously England heavily down the right hand side. And I think, you know, mainly down to, I think they've got a strong right hand side. I think that's kind of a tactical play. Is, is that something again, again, not to kind of, again, just to compare things to what you're doing, but, you know, do you kind of play through that system where, again, I'm guessing they're just playing down? Because I know Lucy Bronze is obviously winning Ballon d'Ors or... or yeah. well, it helps um, with the fan plays you play to the you play to mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. um, But I think the key thing is obviously trying, you've got to try and nullify those things um, when yeah. you're trying to play against them. So, obviously, it's the obvious thing for, for any case, any opposition type team is to try and nullify where teams are going to be strong. Um, the data, like when you've got the right set of data coming into you, you 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 can make those decisions. Not like definitely can form those decisions. If you know a team is going to play, if their centre backs are going to play a long percentage, a percentage of high percentage of long long passes, then you got to prepare your back line to deal with long passes. Um, yeah. So you, know, you know, you know, if they if they've got a target centre forward. And the centre backs are going to play long into that centre forward. For example, from I know from your reports, you've got like the passing, uh, the passing uh, matrix, and also the passing directions as well within the report. Yeah, uh, something that we could we would use as an example. Um, you know, to go okay. So if they're going to play long into the centre forward, a lot we need to stop them playing long. It's just an example. Um, yeah. So, um, That's so, it's something that you know you try and link in as much as you can, and then like I said, if you've got videos back up, then great. Um, and then you got again, like I say, you try and cover all bases. Then, so like I said, obviously, England's way of so you try and nullify the right hand side if they're going to go left. How do you stop them from exploiting the space that you've left on the pitch? Yeah, um, so yeah, really, that's in terms of obviously, just giving you a quick overview. Really, um, there's obviously other elements of the report that we've looked at as well, like transitions to attack, goalkeepers analysis, um, other, other elements of, of the game as well that we've used to kind of cross reference. Um, so it's like a nice little snapshot, really, of, of, what, of what, what we did. Uh, the FAW and these, these projects are still ongoing. I mean, they, they are good things to do. And I think if, if anyone's even in the club environment, if you've got someone who can. Uh, undertake these types of projects. I think they're very, very useful because I think it's, it's, it's data in the now, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's, it's relevant yeah, in every single case. Um, so for us, it's important. And obviously then that, for us, that's, when I was at the FAW, this is a big thing for us. It's, it's like I said at the start, it, the lack of it um, definitely helped me um, trying to push and push and push to try and get some form of informative data toward, towards the coaching staff um, when I first went in. So like, coach education is a big one in Wales. They've, they've got a great coach education system. Um, and having to be part of myself, it, it's like this study is being used there now. So that's great for us. You know, that's good for, good for Instack, good for me, good for FW Trust, FW, you know, everyone, everyone's benefited from that. Um, yeah. um, and in terms of player development as well, that's, that's going to inform some parts of the player development pathway. So if we know for example, final third attacks, if there's a high percentage of 1v1s, mm -hmm. uh, there's the chances create from 1v1s. We know that we need to produce defenders that are good in 1v1s, uh, 1v1 defenders. Um, and that helps the play development system. And obviously, that informs us as a national side as well. So, obviously, um, I know that we looked at a lot of teams in depth from this tournament and we tried to sort of cross reference where we were at as a side and what bits we could take from it. Um, and again, at the end of the day, it's like it's what it's what these managers and coaches would be feel comfortable with. It's not I I, no, I would never force um, data on anyone unless it's necessary or needed. Yeah. Uh, the beauty of it at times, I think, like I say, if you can tailor it in the right way to what you you've got, 
in your environment and like we call it a game model so the way you want to play uh, if you can gear it towards that so like now at Pathos a lot of the 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 data collection I do is based around how we play um, you know and, they, and we can basically assess our KPIs against how well you know we've, we've done that in, in our game model uh, and that's whether we use in that set of data whether I collect it myself whether we interpret you know the reports uh, given to us as well yeah Lots of different, you know, lots of different sources, so it's good. Um, so in terms of yeah, in terms of that presentation, that's that's, that's where I'm at with that. Um, I know you wanted to jump on the system, didn't you? And yeah, for sure. And yeah, we'll jump on the system there. And again, it, I think you know, just just bounce off the back of that. I think it just highlights, um, you know, again the importance of the coach education in, in hand in hand with the play development, in, and again in hand in hand, kind of one big spiral with with the data um, there to support all that and to kind of help like I said, grow that again, coaches get better, players are obviously naturally going to get better. Um, and again, like I said, it's all fine tuned and all, all, you know, developed through that data that, that's provided from, from ourselves. Um, so, so again, you know, it, it's good to see, like I say, how first and that's used and to hear it and then, and then to see how it's benefiting teams. And, um, you know, I know you were talking about Paphos um, this season and how, how you've done and how you've kind of gone from the positions you were and then kind of increase that. Uh, and again, I'm sure, you know, a lot of it has to, has to do with yourself and, 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 and obviously the other coaching staff as well and the systems you put in place and, and the data, like, you know, that, that, that definitely drives a lot of that improvement. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to say it's on me, but it's not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, no, it's, uh, I mean, like, there's a lot of things that go into it. The, the, the big thing is the buy-in from the players. And I think credit to uh, Cameron, Rich, Gary, uh, and the rest of the staff here have pulled together really well in like I said, when I was speaking on the call before to you, you know, we, we, we had three wins in 13 games, we're languishing around relegation area when, when Cameron came in. Um, and he's, he's managed to sort of pull everyone together. And likewise with the players, they've pulled together. It's been the same, it's the same squad of players that have, have done this and succeeded. Um, like I said, now they've led themselves to the highest ever finish that Pathos has had in their right. history. So, you know, it's credit to, to all of them. Um, and that's just not, that's not just buying from analysis, it's buying from, you know, the guys as coaches, buying on the performance side of things as well, like everything. Um, so it's good, it's good to create that. And I think it, you know, as long as we increase the understanding of what we're doing, why we do it. Um, and like, like, for example, in my area, that is, that is a key thing to try and put across why we're doing things. Yeah. Um, whether we use Insta or, you know, other forms of, uh, video or whatever for analysis um, purposes uh, mm -hmm. so it's good. it's good for us as a, it's good for us as a team to develop yeah. now just to see what we do over the next sort of hopefully the next 12 months we can, we can go even further on what we've built in the last, in the last sort of three or four months yeah no and again it'd be interesting to see kind of the areas or, or things you like about the system and things you focus on you know when kind of first hand using this so so yeah, just kind of you know enlighten us and uh, and, and kind of show us around a little bit and, and yeah. how it's day to day. I mean, I'll, I'll touch on I'll touch on from both an international and club perspective. I think the the main one from uh, which probably would link to both sides of things. Obviously, it, it, it's basically the hub where I get a lot of, I'd get a lot of my stuff for opposition analysis from. Yeah. Um, whether you use this system or anything else, you you. Absolutely, the best one of the best things I found within that, especially international level, was your coverage of games. Um, not just from a senior perspective, but from a, a youth age group perspective. And I said to, um, I said to you earlier, like we were, especially as an FAW Trust perspective, I know they were grateful for that because they've got coverage of teams uh, that you know that are, they come up against in Euro qualifiers or uh, elite rounds, um, and the access to that is. Is something that's great. Um, whether you can type in teams here, and I know if I just type in Wales now, for example, um, the the um, within that um, smart search, you'll see now as it comes up, we've got all the teams there, male and female, um, at all age groups. And whether I do that for like a France or an Italy uh, mm -hmm. or any other team, like for example, I'm, I'm sure I can do it for the club teams as well, and it, it comes up with a, a good amount of games um, and clips that we can access. Um, again, like from an overview point of view as well, it's good to see like some key stats as well. So like, um, I know we get these, we'd get these in report format as well. So sometimes yeah. we use the platform for that, but it's always good to see just some little things as well when you see as a summary. 
Um, I think, like for example, now, like I know this has been introduced over the last couple of years with you guys, like the XG value. That's quite, it's a new thing. It's a yeah. Big thing. Um, it's, it's something that's becoming more and more popular. Like XG is basically the chance of importance and quantity put together, basically. Um, yep. And uh, it's something that you know it's it's very good for. Um, basically, sort of how well you've dominated the game. Yeah, I'm a huge fan. You know of XG, and again, there's expected assists as well into the system. And again, you know, I'm always intrigued by uh, by these statistics on those. Uh, and again, they're, they're very interesting. Again, and just or in a nutshell, show you how almost how clinical a player is is being, and how ruthless they're being with with those opportunities. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I mean, it's good as well. Like obviously, we've got we've got the bits of all our matches, the players we've got. Uh, if we want to look at the players, um, I know that um, again. So we spoke about set pieces earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, if I, I had the main one I tend to use when I use the platform was the episode search. Oh, really? It's not easy just to have everything in one place. I just, I'm just like that other person. Uh, I like to sort of just access that way. So you know, you've got yeah. all these areas here. Um, so for example, I use a lot of this to sort of prepare videos for the, for the goalkeeper coach uh, at Wales, okay. uh, mainly within the set plays. So... Um, for example, opponent free kicks. Um, we'll see on the pitch. Now, obviously, this is in the last ten matches. Um, we don't have many against us, um, which is good. <laughs> but um, the the it would show location on the pitch as well. So you know, if they're going to be, for example, the shooting, if they're shooting from these free kicks, mm -hmm. I could reference on the map of okay, if it's within this range, they're probably going to have a shot. Or if it's within this range or this area of the pitch, they're going to they're going to deliver into the box. So it just gives us a little bit of information there. Um, and then if I jump back into sort of um, the matches and stuff, if I jump into an actual game uh, in a minute, um, this is quite an informative thing as well. It's obviously you've got all the stats in one place uh, from the games. And then the key things as well I would do, I, I tend to actually download um, XMLs and XLS files from you guys. Um, yeah. to my own database so I'd, obviously I've got my platform and it's code games on um, but again a time saver would be obviously for example within these games I would go on a player um, or actually within this game I could just go on this game actually and just download the XML file and I'd have all my players clips within there straight away which is something is, is again it's not just a time saver but it's valuable because you know we we when you save time for us, it, it actually now enables us to focus on a lot of things that we need to do within, within the role. Um, yeah. um, and also within that, you've obviously got your breakup, um, your positional attacks, your counter attacks. Um, again, if we want to do an, an opposition analysis on, you know, if I go back into the episode search, because that's something I feel comfortable with. So the you know, counter attacks, do they count down right, left, center side? Um, if I was an opposition artist, where's their transition threat? So how do we stop that as well? That's another thing we could look at. Um, so there's lots of different reasons why you know I would use use the platform in that case, um, not just from a collective video perspective, but also I, I find that I find the map sometimes is an interesting reference for things as well. So I think sometimes you can actually, especially where you plot the attacks. Um, it's interesting to see where where the attacks start and what direction you know, sort of what further the pitch are starting as well. It's yeah. interesting. Now, again, it's interesting. You kind of you, you like to focus on the episode search a lot. Um, again, it's it's literally you know uh, a, a jungle there of, of possibilities and and kind of things you can you know put together even from player link ups there. I mean, if you ever use kind of stuff with teammates with with certain players on the field, how players play with other players. I mean, you can see underneath the, the pitch there itself, that the kind of time scale, so you even can, can concentrate on, on a certain time of the game or, you know, from the first half to the second half and compare things. Um, so again, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's a real in-depth, in-depth tool that you can use there. Yeah. And like, it's great because you can go, you can, I could just focus on one particular position. So if I was, I could focus on all my wide players within this over the last 10 yeah. games. Or I could, I could, uh, speak about opponent players as well. So I could look, I could look at particular type of fullbacks my wingers were playing against, for example. So if they were playing against fullbacks that possess a lot of pace, 
what methods do they use to be successful or were they not successful or you know if they play against full backs, they have a lot of pace do they have they less space for him in behind where he's not exploited it you know there's different things where i can go and go in and sort of reference that so it's definitely yeah. something it's good, it's good to use for that perspective yeah yeah no doubt about that um and again i i think you know again it'd be kind of good to look at the, the set pieces side of things and, yeah, and, and see see how you know see how that works and we saw, saw a few screenshots from it but kind of you know how would you look to set up from this you know what data do you gather game by game and yeah it's just it's just stuff as i said you can pull out so like obviously uh, if i go into opponent set pieces yeah. uh, the you know we, we've seen where this, this shows obviously where teams have tried to attack us over the last the 10 games uh, it's an interesting visual there so obviously the teams have obviously tried to attack us um primarily within uh, within that penalty, penalty spot region. Um, and obviously then the directions of crosses off there, I would have to decipher a lot of that to try and sort of see where the where teams have been successful and successful against us. Um, yeah. And you can decipher it by flank, whether we're in swing, out swing, not, not just from our perspective, but also against what, what teams are. If you're doing an opposition analysis, you can look at if they, all right, if they, they prefer in swing or out swing deliveries. You know? Yeah, no, no, again, it, it, like I say, extremely important information. Um, obviously, it kind of looks like a big mumbo jumbo, you know, <laughs> on, on the on the grid when it's ten matches. Obviously, you know, yeah. you can find, fine tune those down, and you know, even go to select whatever games that you want to select. So, obviously, if you're playing mm. an individual opponent, I'm sure that this is something like, I if you're playing Apoel, I'm sure that's something you go on and then kind of look. Hey, obviously, how have we done previously against the team? And um, and you know, obviously, how have other opponents? It's hard, it's, it was hard as well. I think it's obviously being I'm from the UK, so obviously I'm not really I didn't really hear about much about it over here in that in, in the UK. We didn't really hear about many other Cyprus teams apart from Apoel and maybe mm-hmm. North Cyprus uh, due to them playing in Europe. Um, but um, obviously, then now I, I've had to come in and learn a lot about the Cypriot league and you know the, the trends within it. Um, and obviously, set plays is a big focus. Uh, Myself and Gary Richards and, and Cameron would would look at these in detail. Um, we, you know, obviously that's, that's something that's you got to learn about all the teams within the league. So I obviously haven't played any of these teams before, and and mm-hmm. before, and before coming into it, obviously we have to do a lot of background information. So obviously I'd use an advanced selection of matches to go back to the previous game we played, so just so I can sort of say, okay, is that team doing the same trends as what they were doing when we last played us? So. Is a possible reason we'd have in our mind if, if they've if they've done something against our setup before. Um, there's even more important to us as well because obviously we, we've not been here long. Mm-hmm. Uh, to see how they exploited our system last time. Yeah, and again, I, I don't know if it's possible if it if it will work, but it's also cool on the grid or on on the kind of diagram. If if you click on one, sorry, just the one above, if you kind of click on one, you know, opportunity how you can just it'll take you straight to the video itself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not, not who does it and you know where mm-hmm. it was, you know, where it was uh, well, again it was in the half a minute so yeah for example yeah and yeah then, yeah just kind of how it works and yeah yeah and I think that's interesting how <laughs> good job I didn't concede from that one I'd have been good one to <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah, no, it's a, yeah, it's definitely good to decipher that information as well. I think when you've got when you sort of do your opposition analysis as well, like you said, you've got taker and the taker on there and mm-hmm. uh, side again, side has come from you, you. You sort of then know you start to know about players that are good on, yeah. on place, um, and obviously you're drawing that information from other people that work within the Cyprus League as well. Um, yeah, and then here's just a backup the, 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 the statistic behind that, basically. Yeah. Um, no, no, you know, that, that, that's cool. And again, I think, you know, one more, it'd be cool to look at the shots chart there real quick, just kind of briefly on that. Um, with you, I don't know if you kind of use this much at all. And, and obviously, if you kind of hover over each one, you know, you can see again with the expected goal stats. Um, I think that's another another cool one again on, on, each, on each chance uh, as well and that you can see. And again, just like the last one, you know, click on anything and it will, it will show the goals, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I think this is this is a pretty interesting one. I like this goal a lot. So <laughs> and Sanagado Shirok. 
So yeah, this has got right. you know, XG values quite low on this one. Mm -hmm. uh, so <laughs> yeah, it's obviously a very good goal. Um, yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting to see, like you say, um, your main shot takers, um, type of attack it's come from again, and you know the, the yeah. It's also good to sort of like I said decipher what our high the high XG chances were. Um, obviously yeah. you're going to be you're going to be in the round quite close to goal within a good shooting opportunity but like then you can sort of go back even further and how do we create them um, mm -hmm. um, so it's good it's good to, it's good to go through that way um, I would say I would use even though it sounds a bit, a bit different I would, wouldn't use the zones as much as I'd use the actual individual plots because I would probably go through I'd rather filter it all out mm -hmm. do this stuff uh, it's just the way I work I think, I think I'd just prefer to do it that way Especially if I was looking at an opponent as well, um, just because I think sometimes uh, uh, people's grid lines are not always are always different. So I think like when this is a discussion we've had, I know I've had with Instat quite a lot. It's like you know, is <laughs> your zones are people's zones are always different. Just it's, yeah. it's just it's like you know, it's, it's just it's just, it's just different in, in that respect. But, um, but you know, I mean, like it's good. It's multifunctional in that respect. Of yeah. Just, just uh, you know, I can filter all what I want out and. And get get the, the things I need. Yeah, for for me with the zones, the kind of main focus from that for me is is you know the natural flow of it, making sure that you know predominantly you know like again like a top team would do if you were to look at you know Liverpool stats for the Premier League or or, or you know PSG for, for for French League in that zone in that attacking zone in that box again it'd always predominantly be there. So again, obviously this is quite quite healthy. Again for. For, for you guys here, you can see the zones, 58% within the box there, 34 shots on target out of those 59. I think, you know, still it's important to be kind of playing to that again, you know, where the most of the chances are coming into that, that danger area. That's where your focus wants to be. I've seen teams, if they're not taking the predominant amount of shots in that area, you know, maybe they need to start asking some questions about their attacking play. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, so I reference as well, like with obviously Wales as well. To cover both sides in terms of the, the roles I've had lately, um, particularly in the female game, the the, the data doesn't change, um, which is great. Which is a good, you know, it's the coverage of it is, is really good. Yeah, uh, so that's that's really good for us. Um, obviously, that was useful to to me when I was in that role, um, and also obviously to the coach there now as well. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, like I say, it's, it's interesting to kind of hear your thoughts on it from. A first-hand perspective where you're actively using the system, you know, you know, to benefit the team. Um, so that's interesting. Um, kind of moving on to a couple of, I think, might be a couple of questions on 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 the stream itself. Um, I think one of the I'll first stop, ones was. I'll stop sharing. I'll come back to you. Yeah, yeah no problem. Um, and then I think it's, I think it's kind of um, coming back to the final third stuff, but it's um, it's touching on Matthew Shepherd. Uh, is the final third entries actually linked to goal scoring efficiency and, and chance creation? Um, is there any direct link between those? And obviously, it's something you use. So, you know, what? Yes, when, when we, when we uh, initially coded, we did the, the project, um, we, we had a very, um, what's the word, sort of uh, an emphatic code window where there's a lot of, lot of labels, um, whether, you know, the final third was successful and successful, um, types of final third as well. So, we managed to sort of break it down to sort of six categories. So like one ones crossed into the box, overload in wide areas or down the center, central areas. Um, what else was there? Through ball, whether it's from a long pass or a deep pass, uh, from coming from maybe from a midfielder or a defender, uh, in, in, in behind or onto the opposition back line. Um, and we, when we sort of deciphered that information um, ourselves and sort of looking to cross-reference as well. We would link it to efficiency, but I think the, the idea behind the conversion rate was behind was more to do, okay, what we've also got teams that have got a high number mm -hmm. uh, they're playing at the international level, they, it's going to be high. Um, so, you know, the conversion rate is always an important one to look at because it's the quality uh, that these teams are producing at the end of their chances as well. So Yeah, I agree. And again, I think it just highlights that, the fact that the guys that you kind of had had at the top of that chart, you know, the guys that were doing it the best were the, were most uh, the teams that were the most successful. You know, like you said, USA were pinpointed right there, and I think you know that that's 
the best example of it as well. Um, but uh, we've got one from Essa as well. How would you defend against a team like Italy, um, which has fast players and tries to counter attack immediately? So how would you how would you look to set up against a team like that? Interesting. Um, me personally, um, obviously with Wales, we we um, we did play them. Um, in terms of what I'm as well going to speak about, it's not directly linked to that as such. Um, but I would say that if you're going to deal with a team that's um, decent on transition with fast fast players, forward runners, you if you're in your attacking play, you've got to make sure you've got good defensive balance. So defensive mm-hmm. balance, you've got you know, you've got players behind the attack that. Uh, are able, you know, a decent enough number to deal with the attacking threat that could come. So, for example, you know, you, you wouldn't, some teams, if you wanted to pray, you could leave one versus one at the back. But, you know, I would go safety in numbers, you know, maybe four, which is two strikers, maybe leave four, four defenders back. Um, whether that's, that would fluctuate, depend on um, the players and where the position of the ball is on the pitch as well at the time when we're, when we're in possession of the ball. So, if that ball gets turned over, um, we can't, um, you know, we can't be sort of exploited in the areas that Italy will will try and exploit. Um, I mean, if it, as well for me, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't try and open up the pitch against Italy as well. So obviously, you've seen there uh, in one of the clips against Brazil, uh, Brazil yeah. tried to go after, uh, tried to go after Italy on a high press, and they've, ex- they've left the pitch wide open, obviously because Italy tried to play with a lot of depth and width. They've, they've yeah. made the pitch big, a lot of space, and um, they've got technical ability to to try and. Um, Exploit that, but if I've got players that can do those things, you know, mm-hmm. can high press and can maintain the physical element of doing that, then I would probably, you know, you could you could explore that option as well. It depends what you've got around you. I think if if it's if you want to be safe and you know if you want to be a bit more cautious, which probably would be my preferred option, I would do that and have numbers back for defensive balance when in possession of the ball. Um, but if I knew that um, I had the players that could maintain that. Uh, physical element I would I could also explore that option okay yeah no no it sounds great and and finally we're kind of kind of end on on this one I guess uh, it, it looks like you know we've got one person here kind of you know questioning kind of the enjoyment and saying you know is it is the need for kind of this this amount of analysis into a game but but again I think obviously it's extremely important but but again obviously there's a huge important imagine teams weren't using this and 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 the team was you know What's that real benefit there, and you know what? What would you say, kind of, to the analysis side of the game like that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. That's actually, that's at times I would agree with that person what they've said because I think at times we've got <laughs> uh, an instinct to go too far, um, yeah. and that's when detail becomes really, really confusing. So that's what I spoke about earlier about sort of clarity and something I said which worked at Pathos Wales and other teams in the past. It's just it's coaches that I've you know I've worked with who I think have been great. Uh, delivering a clear message they're not you know they're not mm-hmm. constantly going into deep detail and then once you do that you, you completely lose yeah you lose players and sometimes you lose yourself so I can, you could completely go into the game and you know really decipher all that information and go, you know all that data all that you know all the tactical elements of the game really you know really deep in detail and yeah. you can forget some of it and you can forget yeah. by the time someone's Formed a like a, a, a produced another problem for you. You've got mm-hmm. to do that process again. If you're doing that live in a game, or you know, speaking from like a coach's perspective, you see to deal with that live in a game is it's, it's intelligent stuff from from coaches to do that and deal with that. Um, but like this, this is stuff we've seen. So it's not it's not us going right. Let's let's look at everything in minute detail. It, it's yeah. like, and we found a trend. Let's explore it. Um, like I'd do it in a club if we, you know, if we were con- conceding goals from set plays on left, right, centre, we would we would look at why we're doing it, yeah, and try and yeah. stop. Yeah, and it works both ways. If we, I mean, teams try and do this to try and get ahead in terms. Of, okay, let's try and get above the trend, but that's that's quite an increasingly difficult thing to do. And like uh, the person says, it's is there a need to do it all the time? No, um, yeah. I think it's just interesting to find out where you're at uh, as yeah. a team. Yeah, no doubt. Again, you know, I, I definitely, you know, see where you're coming from with with people how they can almost drive themselves insane with it. Um, but but I think there's definitely, you know, definitely almost fundamental areas where it's kind of like, like I said, like you know, like the set piece data where it's like, look, you know, like I said, not to go too crazy. It's just like the simple stuff. Like, look, you're going to gain that almost competitive advantage on teams if you're aware already 
kind of in hindsight to prepare us how is this team going to attack us what are their strongest areas you know from a simple kind of um, offset and and again making sure that the team's best prepared to be the most effective they can be against opponent and because there's so I guess there's so much money involved in the game now like you know if, if you guys were to be successful you know there's, there's European football that's that's a potential there and again you know obviously um, you know how can that how can that positively affect a club? So again, I think it's these fine margins where realistically, you know, these top top teams, these top sides, again, using those those, those fine margins again within reason, and again, great man management and coaching as well. And I know, yeah, I know, we, I know, we're going to have another uh, one of these again on in June mm-hmm. um, with another analyst as well. And I'm sure this is some of the stuff we can kind of go into and explain why we do these things. Uh, yeah. You know, like I said, there's been times where you know you can we can go too deep, and it, it means that you know you lose people. And if you if you, it's the what last thing I would want to do in my role is confuse my coach. Yeah. Um, I would try to be as clear as possible for them. And so, like I said, to, like right at the start, I said make informed decisions. That's it's a, it's a lot of this is about trying to produce decent, you know, decent decisions for the right. The right reasons for them to sort of help the environment succeed. Simple. Yeah, and it must be tougher when it kind of comes to that situation when everything you're implementing is almost feeling right. You know, you feel like people are progressing, but then the results on the field, you know, don't quite come to fruition. I think that yeah. must be a tough time when people are questioning, saying, "What's going on?" You know. Yeah, it's in, it, like sort of football is unfortunately like that. You, you, yeah. you, can, you can hit everything in the world and <clears> get the result. There's been, I'm sure, there's been times for Paphos and for the coaches here they've, and they're, you know, I've seen it and been involved in it at times where we've dominated games and we, you've lost 1-0 and you know it's the reasons why uh, that happened you know that's when we, we sort of decide for that and okay, make sure it doesn't happen next time and, but you try and encourage yeah. to keep going the way you're going because you're still going the right direction if you're hitting what you want to achieve yeah yeah no problem um that makes great sense and again I appreciate the time I really do Charlie um, obviously you know we'll, we'll have a you know another opportunity in future another presentation so if anyone you know kind of didn't get the questions in or they've got something to ask in future make sure you kind of tune in and I'm sure there's more information to be learned uh, then again in the future because again there's so much that goes into this world of, of football and statistics and analysis um, you know it's never ending and I'm sure you know that firsthand so again really appreciate the time really appreciate everyone coming out um, you know to take part um, and yeah, and hopefully you're staying safe and uh, we'll speak very soon.